Welcome to Radio Free HPC. This is where we talk about supercomputing, high performance computing, and other technology topics. I'm your Toastmaster, Rich Bruckner from Inside HPC, with my co host, Dan Olds from Gabriel Consulting, and Henry Newman from Instrumental. Now let's get to the show. But let's move on to next. We've got uh, I.O. performance challenges. So technology direction is going to be important to figure out the I.O. challenges because I.O. is not scaling, as we know. Storage isn't scaling. Even if you put everything on a spinning disk, that's not scaling, whether it's density or performance. So you're going to have to understand technology, make some choices, do the correct budgeting, to make sure that you can do what you want to do and what you need to do for your business in your archive. Makes sense. And you're going to have to have a hierarchy as well. Right. And do a good job of putting the right stuff at the right place at the right time. Exactly. And what are the performance requirements and what, how, where do you put, invest in between you know, fast storage, disk, and tape as it stands today? Those are our three hierarchies. And how does that impact migration? How does it impact access time? What if something important comes up in the architecture and you need to take that into account all of a sudden? What if you're the CDC and you've got a new virus that's got to get sequenced and you've got to compare it with old viruses? Yeah, tough problems. And actually, I think you show this better on a a chart on the next page. Exactly. This is uh, the capacity of gigabytes per second, uh, ba- excuse me, bandwidth of gigabytes per capacity. So bandwidth in megabytes per second per gigabyte of capacity. So when I started, the first disk drive I was on was a Cyber 819 on the Cray, Cray 1A. Mm-hmm. And it was a th- three megabyte per second drive. And it had... Uh, That's pretty fast for those days. It was darn fast, and it had it was huge. It was 80 megabytes. Wow, man! And it was expensive, as I recall. Oh, I bet it was, uh, it was pricey. <laughs> and if you compare tape in '77, you look at there was a factor of uh, you know three or so in in cost difference. But look at where where we are today, we, between disc and tape. I said cost. I meant performance, by the way, on tape. If you look at today, we've gone down quite dramatically in terms of our megabytes per second per capacity, and the trend is not going to change. What this is really showing is that capacity has exploded, while the the bandwidth has grown, of course, but much more slowly. Correct. That's a hell of a chart. If you need it, I'll send it to you, Dan. It's just a, a spreadsheet I put together. So, let's dive into metadata. And Henry, you have another line for this. Yeah, it's pretty much the same, Dan. Those who own the archive own the big data solutions as you're re-indexing or figuring out what in metadata that you need that's new is going to be impossible at future scale or remotely. I was raised to believe that nothing is impossible, Henry. Well, in... There is impossibility of, of, because you can't afford it. Impossible means in this case is, what's the cost? If you don't own the archive, you've outsourced it to, you know, Amazon or Google or Dropbox or whomever. The cost and the bandwidth is going to, as I showed you, is going to kill you. But there are other issues. If you need to re-index and pulling the archive over a, a remote network is impossible from a cost perspective. And if someone else owns the archive and it's local to them and you've outsourced it, you might be able to re-index it on their machines but then you need to bring your new database back. And the industry seems to be wanting to outsource everything. But long term, I think you can have negative financial impact on those companies that do this. Isn't that a hell of a load, though, on somebody else's machines to re-index frequently? Well, I mean, will they, will they allow you to do that? And it's going to be a hell of a cost. But when you need to go do it, you know, re-index is in quotes, it's conceptually re-index or conceptually go through your data to find something new or correlate new information, there's going to be a huge cost. And you could burn up a lot of S3 dollars there, but you kind of don't know when you're going to need it and what the cost is. And then you've got to bring it back. And the other issue is the security implications. If your archive is somewhere else uh, and it's not under your control, there is a inherent security risk. 
Sure. The more public something is, less control you have over the data. Absolutely. And whoever is holding that, hosting that data for you, it's almost guaranteed that whatever SLA you have with them doesn't extend to the worst case that they will make you whole because they couldn't afford to be in that business if they had to take on that level of liability. Like, for example, the CDC's example I gave you. If we get a, a new virus that's starting to wipe people out wherever it begins and they, are, they have the information to sequence it, they have the information to compare it, I don't want the CDC to arc, you know, outsource their archive. I want them to have it available and be able to hit return and have enough computational power to go figure things out. And that will help them in case we have something like the coming zombie apocalypse. And they have to go out and, and find out what is the source of that virus and how you can deal with it. I'm not so sure about the zombie apocalypse, Stan, but <clears throat> Rich can comment on that. You should read up on it, Henry. A lot of good science behind it. They had a great episode on that on The Walking Dead where they, they go to the CDC. Uh, yeah. the <laughs> sure. That was not, it was, it was staffed by one guy who'd pretty much gone around the bend. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well done. Well done. Yes. Glad I'm not watching TV, guys. <laughs> way, so, to be, way to be well-rounded, Henry. And by the way, there's a show out there both of you should watch uh, called The Big Brain. It's a science challenge where they put geniuses up against each other to come up with uh, solutions to big scientific and mechanical problems, like uh, hitting a missile with another missile. It's a very good show. It's on Discovery Channel. I recommend it to everybody. I will, I will take a look at it. A reason to watch TV. It definitely is. So my final thoughts are, I believe archives are going to be the central point of focus for big data analysis. And to be successful for archives, you're going to need to be figuring out how to plan for them, how to make them reliable, how to scale them, and how to use them. And using them is going to be critical to your success, not just keeping the data. And the companies that w have been successful in the industries, like geosciences, they've done all of the above. I would say retail and financial services as well. I would agree with that. And I think that's interesting because it gets, gets back to something that you mentioned way at the front of this in the first, uh, first couple of slides, is that the companies that actually use their archives and use this data are going to be much more likely to see it as a profit center as opposed to a useless cost center that oh we've got to keep this crap because of regulatory uh, requirements and you know it becomes an afterthought there's going to have to be a mindset change at the top of the organization to understand what the value of this data is long term for the organization and right now a lot of companies are behind the curve, in my opinion, and in, in seeing the value of this data, of their own data, to their own future. I think sometimes it's coming from the top, but I kind of get the feeling that it's coming more from the middle, if that's a, a place in a company. It's coming from uh, the business unit managers and the worker bees who uh, are, are the ones that are saying, you know, if we could just find this out, or... If this correlates with that, we could make some money. I agree with you that the requirements are coming from the middle, but the, they're going to have to convince the people at the top that it's yes. in the interest of the organization. That was my point. Exactly. And, and that's why what we, what we see so much in the, the advice for folks getting into big data is to start with uh, something that you can bite off easily and chew and show a quick positive result a quick positive return, and then use that as ammunition to convince the upper levels that this is something that's a valid strategy needs to be invested in. Yes. So the other point is the archive performance must be matched with data usage requirements over time. Not averages, but you've got to be able to, to address the peak for e whether it's an emergency, a business emergency, a social emergency, whatever your archive is designed for. And... I would suggest that archive management and design requires careful planning. Oh, yeah. And, and there's not a lot of people outside of certain industries doing this right now. And it's more costly the second time. Let's take the second bullet, though, for a second here. A lot of companies, I don't think, are going to know 
what that archive performance needs to be. I don't agree, Dan. I think there's a baseline that they know about or will know about, but it's going to change. The key, though, is to understand what people are thinking about doing with the data and they're, they're, whether they're data scientists or financial analysts or whatever or, you know, any kind of computational scientist and then be – be ahead of their curve rather than being completely reactive and say, oh, we just got inundated. We didn't know it was coming. I stopped listening to everything you said after you said you didn't agree with me. So a follow-up <laughs> that I think that this is going to be a, a moving target, that as they give more people more access to this archival data, that they're going to find that their needs change maybe radically over time. Exactly. I'm total I, that I agree with you about. See now I'm but, listening but, again. But 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 my point is that there the people who are managing the archive need to be engaged with the people that are planning on They're using designing it. it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I I think though what I was kind of aiming towards is if if you're talking to a client who's sort of starting on this road and they realize the value here, they realize they need to have a better solution, would you suggest that they start sort of on the small side and then build out when they realize through use what their actual requirements are going to end up being? Or do you think that they'll have enough information to be able to build a large, highly functional solution that fits their needs right away? I think it's going to be in uh, number one because I evolve. think I, it's got to evolve because I don't think anybody's going to know day one and it be consistent. They might have some projections, but they're going to be wrong. It needs to be a continual process, an ongoing process. And that takes you to the third bullet, which is that answers. It's got to be an ongoing process, and you've got to you know have access to the pe the right people within the organization or uh, that the organization can get at to think about future technologies and how that's going to impact things. I think in some companies, the archive process and function is kind of a backwater. I don't know if you guys would agree with that or not. Yes, it, it's an afterthought. Yes, that this needs to come to top of mind because this is absolutely critical and vital to a company taking uh, that's trying to take advantage of big data. Yes, and in, in their financial and future in some market spaces. Totally agree. Would you say, Henry, that you've issued a wake-up call to the I, entire I, world? I, I I believe I have. I see. Rich, well, did it wake I, you up? I would, I would agree. And uh, as someone who's creating hundreds of gigabytes uh, every week, going to these shows and videotaping, I can tell you that I have no viable archive strategy, and I don't know what to do. So I can't imagine what these enterprises uh, are going to do without um, really sitting down and planning this stuff out and, 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 and making the investments. That's Rich, a good point, I, you Rich. Could, Rich. Rich, you could hire me, and I would help you with your strategy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know what your billable rate is, though, Henry. You're going to really... want to open up a PO <laughs> right away. <laughs> but, you know, that's interesting because – you're creating a lot of custom IP, Rich. I, I am too, but not on the scale you are. Um, I mean, ours can be handled with a NAS, but you're going to need something a little bit more sophisticated down the road here. Yes, you will. And, and you know, but and how important is that going to be for his future long term? And these are the kinds of questions that lots bigger companies are struggling with today. What do we keep? What do we throw out? Oh, we got to throw this out. I don't think that's necessarily the right answer. And the getting bet, you know, that goes to my final thought is without owning the archive, you're dependent on a third party for your future. And the ownership of the raw data, not the process data, is going to be critical because there are going to be new algorithms. There's going to be new information you can extract. You can't get the process data as your baseline. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this this raw data for many businesses in many industries, that's going to be the weapon in the competitive battles. Exactly. And it already is. And we've seen that in certain industries already that are dependent on, you know, in the geosciences industry. Financial oh. services. Exactly. 
Geosciences has got data going way back. Financial services is kind of new to the game, but the geosciences people have been in the archive business since they started collecting data. I would argue that that Walmart that's probably that's one of their one of the chief reasons they're successful. I agree, and that's one of the reasons I would think other department stores have been not as successful that have fallen by the way wayside over the last fifteen twenty years. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. You got to give some credit to the guy who greets you at the door at Walmart too. You the know, old man, that, friend, that friendly old guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the fact they let give you him some, they'll let you yeah. sleep in your car or your RV in the parking lot. <laughs> that's pretty good too. It all adds up. It does. Well, great okay. stuff, Henry. Uh, thank you so much for taking us through this. We really appreciate it. You're welcome, Dan. And that's it for this episode of Radio Free HPC. Tune in again, and we will have more stuff. Right, guys? I betcha. I hope so. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's it for this edition of Radio Free HPC. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check back often for new episodes. Also, check out our website for more content, links, and a place for you to let us know what you think about the show. We're at RadioFreeHPC.com. Thanks again. We'll be back with another exciting episode real soon.